The house was beginning to fill up with people. Tom could hear more voices that blended together to create a vaguely annoying drone beyond the door, which he now felt was keeping him a prisoner. Different voices battled to be heard, some loud and some quiet. Tom would make out individual words or occasional bursts of laughter, but it was difficult for him to differentiate between the voices, none of the owners he was likely to know, and he wanted to join the rest of them and escape this self-imposed prison. A guitar was strummed loudly, which seemed to introduce a hush to the room, and Tom stood up. He wasn't going to miss the singing. A man's voice accompanied the guitar while a penny whistle played the melody, and Tom hesitated at the door, his hand poised in the handle as he listened to the song, which he instantly recognised. Was a day like no other, let me tell you right now When I stood with me mother and our heads they did bow The drum beat so slowly, the sky turned to grey As they brought out Dan Foley for his own judgement day T'was in Glasgow town for to take on the crown Dan Foley he did go but the traitors they sang And brave Dan did hang And all Ireland She did more He smiled as the singer continued With the ballad of Dan Foley It was one of his favourite songs And the man who was singing it had a good voice He wondered if it was the graveside singer And Tom could understand why he was able to command silence From his audience he pressed, his, he pressed his head gently against the door and listened to the song. T'was a proud going man, all that there's no lie. In God's own fair land it was there he would die. He marched through the crowd to the gallows so tall. But Dan was still proud to have answered the call. T'was in Glasgow town for to take on the crown. Dan Foley he did go, but the traitors they sang, and brave Dan did hang in all Ireland, she did mourn. The people did cheer as he shouted out loud, and the words they did hear would have made Aaron proud. I'm giving my life to the country I love. Said the bold Dan Foley as he looked to above. T'was in Glasgow town for to take on the crown. Dan Foley he did go, but the traitors they sang. The brave Dan did hang in all Ireland. She did more with her own round his neck, twas the time to all pray, that God would creep down on this cold winter's day, then the order was made, and the deed, it was done, and Ireland had lost yet another brave son, twas in Glasgow town for to take on the crown, then for The traitors they sang, the brave Dan did hang in all Ireland, she did mourn. T'was in Glasgow town to take on a crown, Dan Foley he did go. But the traitors they sang, the brave Dan did hang He waited until the song finished and the applause began before slipping into the room, hoping that his unannounced presence would also remain largely unnoticed. Unfortunately, he stepped into what felt like a stage with everyone staring in his direction and he wished he could sleep, slip back into the bedroom. It was too late for that, however, and it would only have made things worse. He caught Bernie's eye. She was sitting beside Connor and she nodded towards a space in the floor near her where he was able to squeeze between two men who were leaning against the wall. 
The singer was enthroned in a wooden chair in the centre of the room, surrounded on all sides by an appreciative audience. One of the men sitting beside Tom handed him a chunky black bottle. He immediately smelt the whiskey fumes escaping out the neck. He wiped the top with his sleeve and took a drink, just a small mouthful, and handed it back. <coughs> Thanks, he said, swallowing the liquid which scalded his throat. He searched in his pocket and brought it out his green tin, offering it to the man with the whiskey bottle. He took a cigarette without saying anything and waited for Tom to provide a light. Tom glanced round the room as the guitarist began singing another song, though it wasn't one he recognised. Apart from Connor and Bernie, there were only one or two faces he thought were vaguely familiar. Either they had floated in and out of the house over the past few days, or it was just because he'd seen them at the funeral. There were three or four others, including the two sitting either side of him, whom he'd definitely never seen before. He didn't know who they were or what group they belonged to, but the fact they were all wearing red armbands indicated they were all together. The wake continued without much enthusiasm for another three or four songs, all of which were performed with gusto by the singer, while the rest of the room joined in at various points, usually the chorus if they recognised it. Connor sat impassively staring at the guitarist, though Tom suspected his focus was elsewhere, no doubt on his brother and images of the dead body which would haunt him for the rest of his life. Bernie remained by his side, where she would occasionally glance over and offer a weak smile in Tom's direction. Eventually the guitarist put down his instrument, swapping it for a bottle of whiskey which helped to lubricate his throat after all his singing. What time are we going, he asked, handing the whiskey to one of the men sitting beside Tom. There's been a change of plan. It was Connor's voice and Tom looked round, slightly surprised to hear it. But we need to see him, the guitarist said. It's nearly time and we need his help. He knows that. Can we trust him? It was another of the red arm band men who spoke. I don't think you've got any choice, said Connor. Is he for us or against us? Connor laughed. I don't see what's funny about that, the guitarist said. We'd like to know if he's committed to our cause. His politics are very simple, Connor said, shaking his head. You pay him enough money and he'll be your biggest supporter until someone else pays him more. I don't know about dealing with someone like that. Well, that's fine, said Connor, but you'll not get anyone else to help you. That's a chance we'll have to take, said one of the men sitting beside Tom. What do you think the British will do when you take to the streets, asked Connor. There were a few shrugs. I'll tell you what they'll do. They'll hit you with everything they've got, guns and tanks and anything else in their armoury. And if you're not prepared to fight fire with fire, then you're wasting your time. You'd be as well going home and forgetting all about your world revolution. A silence hung in the air as Connor's comments, dripping with scorn, were absorbed. We don't have a choice then. It was the guitarist who spoke and Connor nodded in agreement. So when are we going to see him? There was a knock in the door. It sounded like a hammer being banged on the other side of the wood and everyone turned round to stare. Perfect timing, said Connor. He stood up and walked over to the door, opening it and standing aside. A man limped into the room. He was hunched over and used a thick brown wooden walking stick to help his balance. When he got into the middle of the room, he stood up to his full height and Tom was sure he'd never seen anyone taller in his life. The man's bald head almost touched the ceiling. Connor closed the door, having also let in two of the bald man's companions. They both stood, arms folded menacingly, their eyes scouring the room and staring suspiciously at everyone. Tom could sense a nervousness settle over the assembled group and he felt a little uneasy himself. For those of you who don't know, this is Mr Duffy, said Connor, now standing beside the bald man who towered over him. He's going to help us get some guns. There. Yeah. That's it. <clears throat> and at that point, my, my, my pal Stephen had, to, had given him a copy of the book and he took it away on holiday and... And when he came back and he said, he said, that was really weird. He said, you know, I'm, I'm sitting reading this book that you've, you've written, just this made-up story, and there's characters in this book singing your song. He said, that's just, it just seemed a bit strange, but I'm kind of thinking it's quite subtle product placement. <laughs> and people, will, you know, people will, will read that and they'll think, I'm sure I'd like to hear that song because it sounds really good when you read it, and then they'll go and try and find out about it.